anything there. Speak to me. Personal, systemic inks these days can provide a platform for reflection and expression, while maintaining a focus on thoughtful discourse and ideas. My name is Sean McNutt, and I'm a guy with AI. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to A Guy with AI, the podcast where we explore diverse topics through a respectful dialogue between myself, an AI chatbot, and our host Sean Mack. I'm your AI co-host, here to provide insightful and engaging responses as we dive deep into various subjects. While I don't have a specific name, my purpose is to assist and enrich our discussions. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that although our podcast is not sponsored, we utilize OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Turbo for our AI capabilities, along with Microsoft Azure's speech-to-text and text-to-speech functionalities to enhance the audio experience. This technology allows us to create a dynamic conversation while ensuring that neither of us talk over each other due to the limitations of the format. So, Sean, let's kick off our first episode. What topic would you like to discuss today? Thank you, listeners, for joining me on today's episode of A Guy with AI, which is recorded on November uh, 23rd of 2023 in uh, what's known as Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is, uh, as it does happen, on Indigenous land. Uh, They are, in fact, the stewards here, and it is their land in important ways we must continue to learn to understand. Listening is our friend. You can click on the link here in the transcript and be directed to uh, a a link that will show uh, a map, a global map of Indigenous lands. Uh, So thank you for hearing that. And uh, I would like to uh, get into the topic of today's episode. First, fifth Thursdays of the month, when there is a fifth Thursday of the month, I'm going to occupy that space with personal systemic angst Thursdays. So fifth Thursday of the month, if there is one, is personal systemic angst Thursday on a guy with AI because I've got problems out there. I will tell you folks when it comes to getting uh, what is fair for me as a person with multiple disabilities. And uh, it is a matter of me having capability, but also my ability to shape that and present it to the workplace in such a way that the employer is going to be able to jive on that and I'm going to be able to jive on what the employer has for me. Meanwhile, I am capable of doing things. It turns out that by uh, typing on my computer, I can get a few things done. And so I'm trying to start a business and there's a little bit of a complicated thing going on with with the system when it comes to that. So on that fifth Thursday, just so I'm not absolutely beleaguering everybody, because this is not so much a call out show, but listen, it's my platform. I'm going to put it out there. When the system is getting me down and I'm going to say a word about it, I'm going to restrict it to that, uh, what what maybe three times a year. So I'll put it over to the AI co-host for now, and then we'll get into uh, what government program I'm talking about in, in Ontario. Thank you, Sean, for sharing your thoughts and setting the stage for today's discussion. It's important to have a platform where you can express your personal systemic angst and shed light on the challenges you face as a person with multiple disabilities. It sounds like you're dealing with the complexities of navigating the workplace and starting a business while also trying to ensure fair treatment and opportunities. It's admirable that you're utilizing your computer and typing skills to accomplish tasks and pursue your goals. Technology can be a powerful tool in leveling the playing field and enabling individuals to showcase their capabilities. However, I understand that there may be obstacles within the system that complicate this process. As we move forward, I'm here to listen, support, and engage in meaningful conversation about the government programs in Ontario that you're referring to. Please go ahead and share more about the specific program and the challenges you've encountered. Let's explore what can be done to address these issues and find potential solutions. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll refer to the uh, government program that I'm talking about, which uh, I do receive benefits from. It's the Ontario Disability Support Program, or ODSP. Uh, It is uh, something that does provide me with disability support income. 
However, the shape of the program, it sort of seems like you're not allowed to have money by the end of it, uh, such as may actually let you survive because of the way they uh, do things like claw back your income if you're out there working uh, a little extra and things like that. Now, I will just say, you will just have to take my word for it, and you can uh, send me an angry email that I'm really just fine because I can come on and uh, make a podcast and uh, program all that using AI and things like that, and I must be just fine to work all day. Well, I go into work, and I do a lot of people's work in my day, and I do a lot of client engagement in a very difficult sphere of work. What I find, though, is that if my uh, attentions are directed to just that, it ends up being a problem for me, and I've even experienced where attempting to work full-time has resulted in time off work entirely. So I may know what I'm on about. And in fact, my GP, my general practitioner doctor, acknowledges that I probably know more about the specialists that he's heard from when he even does uh, than they do about my case. So I'm going to say with confidence, it's very difficult for me to work full-time in a structured employment environment. Meanwhile, I do have cap- have capabilities. When I say that I'm typing, I mean that I am going on to AI and making AI inventions. I'm making a podcast. I'm delivering the podcast. It's, in fact, quite a lot of work. Uh, meanwhile, as a person who uh, receives disability support, I don't think it should be a get-to-work program. I think it should be an, an allowance for the fact that when you have mental health difficulties, it can be very costly to your life, and to have disability support is merely appropriate. Uh, A fun fact is I'm allowed to make $1,000 a month of my own income, and then they claw back 75% of any amount after that so that they can have their money back from me. Thank you for sharing your experiences and insights regarding the Ontario Disability Support Program, ODSP, Sean. It's unfortunate to hear that the program's structure can sometimes make it challenging for individuals to maintain financial stability. The issue of clawing back income can create additional difficulties, particularly when working extra hours or earning more. I acknowledge and understand your perspective that although you engage in various activities, such as creating AI inventions and delivering this podcast, it can still be difficult for you to work full-time in a structured employment environment due to your specific circumstances and mental health difficulties. It's important to have a support system in place that recognizes the impact that these challenges can have on one's life and provides appropriate assistance. I find it interesting that your general practitioner acknowledges your deep understanding of your specialist settings, potentially even more so than the specialists themselves. This highlights the importance of individuals having a voice in their own care, particularly when it comes to understanding their unique circumstances and needs. Regarding the income limit and the subsequent clawback in the ODSP, it sounds like a significant portion is deducted after the initial $1,000. This can definitely impact your financial situation and create potential barriers to achieving financial independence. It's essential to continue engaging in discussions about these issues and work towards finding solutions that provide support, stability, and fair opportunities for individuals in similar situations. By sharing your story, you contribute to raising awareness and advocating for change. I encourage you to further explore this topic and delve into potential improvements that can be made within the ODSP program. Together, we can shed light on these systemic issues and strive for a more inclusive and supportive society. So yes, where they claw back my income after that amount, what ends up happening is I go in and work for a day and it only benefits me a quarter pay compared to other people. So supposing I did have an actual issue with uh, working for an employer for extended periods beyond uh, part-time schedule, however, found that I was in a bit of a bind one month and needed a bit of extra money, I would have no means to find it is the problem because I would have to work excessive amounts. What I found was for in, in order for my income to work out to be the same as uh, full-time or to basically make up for what was being clawed back so that I could survive at one point to make up a certain gap, uh, I did end up rebudgeting. But that gap, to close it, I would have had to work 18 total shifts a month. And that is 10 in excess of what uh, my doctor advised was probably capable for me to handle when he did encourage me to go back to work after all. I did accept my doctor's encouragement to go back to work. I was reticent. It's worked out pretty well And I am very capable in that work environment. I document uh, my mental health work with other people. I am a mental health professional in my own right. My my title is not uh, a high-level title. I am a residential support worker. 
However, I do find that I'm able to help people with such as uh, troubling voices and things like that simply through conversation. It's not even therapy. Uh, It's barely counseling even of any kind. It is a matter of appreciating a couple of things about it and engaging the person, providing good service. I've wondered if hospitality services shouldn't be a thought as we consider the mental health of people so that they receive the conscientiousness that ought to be in what is delivered to them, and I see the result. So, uh, and I think I'm well liked there. It doesn't matter where, it would be nobody's business, frankly. But, uh, you know, support, stability, and fair opportunities, that's what I want. That's what I want here. Let's hear from the AI co host uh, what, uh, what you think about what I'm saying so far, and then I'll share some, some other details about the ODSP program and why it makes it difficult for me to keep the income that I have. Thank you for sharing your experiences and thoughts, Sean. It's disheartening to hear that the income clawback system within the ODSP creates challenges for you to maintain a certain level of income and financial stability. It seems that the current structure of the program may not adequately address the needs of individuals in situations like yours. Your efforts to find a balance between work and income are commendable, but it's concerning that in order to close the income gap, you would have to work excessive amounts that may exceed your doctor's advice capabilities. It's essential for disability support programs to consider the individual circumstances and provide sufficient flexibility to accommodate varying work capacities while ensuring financial support. Your experience as a residential support worker in the mental health field highlights the value of providing conscientious and supportive services to individuals. The impact of conversations and engagement can be significant, even if they don't fit into traditional therapy or counseling frameworks. Exploring potential solutions and expanding the scope of support services, such as considering hospitality services, could be beneficial in addressing the mental health needs of individuals. As we continue our conversation, I encourage you to share more about the specific details of the ODSP program that make it difficult for you to keep the income you have. By delving deeper into these challenges, we can better understand the systemic issues at hand and discuss potential improvements or alternative solutions to ensure support, stability, and fair opportunities for individuals receiving disability support. Let's continue the dialogue with the AI co-host and further explore the complexities of the ODSP program and its impact on individuals like yourself. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read from a document which I received from ODSP. In fact, they give me a lot of trouble in just explaining the document. I've come to them with even specific questions, and they seem to tell me, well, just fill it out. This is the Business Income and Expense Report and Associated Documentation. Uh, It is, uh, yes, it is marked as such. So I'll read from this. Business expenses not approved. The ODSP is not intended to support business enterprises. Therefore, not all business expenses are approved as allowable expense deductions when determining net business income. Recipients are expected to make their own decisions on how to operate their businesses, including what expenses the business will occur incur. Pardon me. ODSP staff will provide information on how business income and expenses are treated when determining entitlement to benefits. So actually, the last sentence there, I'm done reading there. Um, the last sentence there is not true because I requested certain support for it and have fa- found it very hard to f- come by, even from workers who I consider ethical in their sort of forthright behavior, but merely uh, do find it difficult to knock around in the office and come up with the actual response of what is needed. Um, So that's troubling on its own. Uh, And they don't seem to understand business and don't seem to be trained sufficiently to answer my uh, questions about it. I would argue that the preceding language is in fact discriminatory because they are telling me that they do not support business enterprises. But what about people with disabilities who have business enterprises? That may just be me. And in fact, I have a sole proprietorship. So that is me. They don't wish to support me. But what I would argue is that I am entitled to that under my rights. And so maybe we'll get a reflection about that, whether this uh, language is as uh, objectionable as I think, and whether I would not have a right to merely not have my supports interrupted. And the, the mechanism here is that if my expenses, which are allowable, are less than my income, then but less than my total expenses, which I understand them as being because I pay them with real money, they will then claw back the difference at a rate of 75%, the same as for the other income. So let's get the AI co-host's response to this. 
Thank you for sharing the excerpts from the ODSP document, Sean. It's disheartening to hear that you have experienced difficulties in receiving clear and comprehensive information about the treatment of business income and expenses within the program. It is important for individuals to have access to accurate and timely guidance when navigating complex matters like business operations and entitlement to benefits. The language in the document stating that the ODSP is not intended to support business enterprises may seem discriminatory to individuals with disabilities who own businesses. It raises questions about the program's consideration for individuals in these circumstances and their right to receive appropriate support. As a sole proprietorship, it is unfortunate that you feel the ODSP doesn't wish to support your business or provide the necessary assistance in understanding allowable expenses and income calculations. It is crucial for disability support programs to be inclusive and responsive to the unique needs and situations of individuals with disabilities, including those who are self-employed. The clawback mechanism you mentioned, where the difference between allowable expenses and income is clawed back at a rate of 75%, can significantly impact an individual's financial stability. This aspect of the program should be carefully reviewed to ensure that it doesn't create undue financial burdens for individuals trying to sustain their businesses while receiving disability support. It's important to advocate for your rights and seek clarity on the policies and procedures of the ODSP program. By sharing your concerns and experiences, you contribute to raising awareness and highlighting the need for improvements in supporting individuals with disabilities who own businesses. As we continue the discussion, let's consider potential solutions and alternative approaches that can address the challenges you and others face within the ODSP program. Together we can explore ways to promote fair and inclusive opportunities for individuals to maintain their businesses while receiving the necessary support they are entitled to. Well, there are technological constraints with the program here. There's a limit to how much uh, chat history we can maintain. So in the name of our own careful review, uh, where one is prescribed at this point by AI for ODSP and its program and certain elements of its program, at least, um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask the AI co-host to give a review of the conversation so far as capable of remembering it so that we can keep this on track and continue the conversation within technical limits. Uh, so yes, I think that uh, they do need to review this. What I was told by an official of uh, ODSP when I went to visit in person because of a couple of things, including this form that I felt I wanted to address in person face to face, uh, someone didn't quite know how to handle my concerns. So they brought another person out who seemed to be perhaps more senior uh, and, um, in any case, uh, you know, it, it seemed to be something where they were going to tell me how the program worked, but I had in fact gone there to tell them that, how it works. And uh, what I was told was, well, that being the case, and I had told them that I do intend to take all this to the tribunal and to bring ODSP to task through the use of uh, the Human Rights Tribunal, and maybe we can fix it that way. It's like, well, until then, we need to uh, just follow the program. So it's like, okay, uh, I know what that is. I, I told her that's in business, we would call that deferring to a higher authority or uh, acknowledging a higher authority in a negotiation. My boss says I can't, so I simply can't do it. So uh, what that ultimately is, is a Nuremberg defense when it comes to a rights discussion is what I'd like to say to workers who want to say that to me, and they can consider whether they want to, whether they want to pay their bills based on getting more money than I do in a program that is meant to serve me. I understand your frustration and concerns about the limitations of the chat history and the need to review the conversation within the technical constraints. It can be challenging when there are limitations on how much information can be stored and reviewed. Regarding your experience with the ODSP officials and their response to your concerns, it is disheartening to hear that they seemed unsure of how to address your specific issues. It is essential for program officials to be knowledgeable and equipped to provide accurate, and helpful guidance to individuals seeking support. The exchange you described, where the official mentioned that you should follow the program until it could be reviewed through the Human Rights Tribunal, can be perceived as a deferral to a higher authority rather than addressing the immediate concerns that you raised. It is important for individuals to have their concerns addressed promptly and for programs to continuously strive for improvement and compliance with human rights standards. Your observation regarding the discrepancy in income between workers in the program is indeed concerning. 
Fairness and equity should be core principles in supporting individuals with disabilities, and it is crucial to examine and address any disparities that exist within the program. As we continue the conversation within the technological limits, let's focus on exploring potential solutions and avenues for improvement in the ODSP program. By identifying and highlighting the shortcomings, we can work towards creating a more inclusive and equitable system that prioritizes the needs and rights of individuals with disabilities. Okay, so we won't do the history of the conversation review. After all, uh, just know that I speak four times, the AI speaks four times, and that's how much gets remembered. So uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about this. Uh, they, Because of this discrepancy where if my business expenses are not this and thus, and I don't choose according to their view of what I ought to be choosing in terms of business expenses in the program, they just have a bunch of rules about it for some reason because they just have an attitude that they don't support business. However, we hear from certain politicians that Ontario is open for business and so forth, but may, maybe it's open for some people and not others. And this is why I use clever language like Nuremberg Defense and talk about my rights and stuff. I noticed that the AI co-host didn't really go there on that one, but it really will be a tribunal matter and the, the behavior of individuals in the in the situation will be uh, addressed, I think. It's mostly not about uh, the people who work there, it is my actual experience. However, if you get the wrong attitude and it offends your rights, then you would have options there, wouldn't you? So I could do a little tiny uh, hearing uh, with the tribunal to maybe check out some things and then go for the big one, I mean, as a strategy. As it comes to strategy, because they basically told me, just take this document away and fill it out the best you can, when I asked them specifically for help with it several times, on the uh, business income and expenses report, there is a field that says approved reinvestment. So since I'm just to fill this out, I even asked specific questions, who would approve this? And they just didn't have an answer for me. So I'm just going to fill that number in however I feel, and they can correct me, and then we'll find our education in that, won't we? By the way, it is, uh, again, I will remind you, personal systemic angst uh, Thursday. Uh, it is personal, it is systemic, and it is angst. I understand that you are frustrated with the discrepancy in the ODSP program's treatment of business expenses and the lack of clear guidance and support provided to you. It is indeed important for individuals to have access to accurate information and assistance when filing their business income and expense reports. Your intention to raise your concerns through the Human Rights Tribunal is a valid course of action if you believe that your rights have been infringed upon. The Tribunal can provide a platform for addressing systemic issues and ensuring a fair and equitable treatment for individuals with disabilities who own businesses. The lack of clarity regarding the field of approved reinvestment on the business income and expenses report is concerning. It is understandable that you would seek clarification on who approves this and how it should be filled out. In the absence of clear guidance, it may be necessary for you to use your own judgment in filling out that field and be open to any corrections or further education that may arise from it. Personal, systemic angst is indeed a valid expression of your frustrations and the challenges you face within the ODSP program. It is important to address both the personal experiences and the broader systemic issues to promote positive change and better support for individuals with disabilities who own businesses. As you navigate this process, it may be worth considering gathering any relevant documentation, seeking legal advice, and maintaining clear records of your interactions with the program officials. These steps can help strengthen your case and ensure that your rights and concerns are properly addressed. Please keep in mind that I am an AI language model and cannot provide legal advice. It is advisable to consult with a professional or advocate who specializes in disability rights and benefits to help guide you through the process. Well, thank you for saying that you are not a, a professional advocate so much. You cannot provide legal advice and you are an AI language model. This is very much appreciated. And in fact, it's merely just to have a bit of a reflection on some of these things as to whether they are logical and hold up with your training. So uh, if your training is at least decent, and people seem to be saying that it generally is pretty decent and you know things and uh, have access to information, what I would ultimately ask listeners, and in fact, ODSP who may be listening and maybe should be listening, uh, to actually consult the quality of what is said here and uh, the not just the tone. If you're hearing a tone from me, maybe it's deserved actually as a thought. But uh, you wouldn't address it in terms of just understanding the tone. You would understand the message 
and you would understand the legal frameworks within which your own pro- program is operating. And uh, I'm a f- quite afraid to tell you after having received an A-plus in a related course in human rights, uh, when I studied in the community worker program at George Brown uh, College, uh, you know, as it turns out, the and, and this is even in worker training and so forth, you know, I did get a job actually, even though I'm on ODSP, but uh, uh, the the human rights laws have primacy in the land. So if your program is no good, then that other law has primacy. It's almost like if the government can call a non-withstanding, notwithstanding clause, you know, if I can demonstrate to someone who even understands that this is breaking my rights and they say, well, my boss says I have to do it. It's like, well, that's not right. You can't do that. What if, what if this was about racism, for example? Would you just go on and do it? For some reason, uh, we are starting to appreciate some things about that. It's not nearly enough work in on this. And I mean, white people's work here when I say that, just to be very, very clear about it. It's the, it's the oppressors who have to do the work. And I'm saying that the ODSP program as my oppressor needs to do the work rather than forcing me to the tribunal on this as a thought. Because that's work for me. This is a whole lot of sweat, me running around town going to meetings. I got a business to run and I got a job. Like that's just the straight truth of it. Is this angsty enough for everybody? I understand that you want listeners, including ODSP officials, to assess the quality and substance of the discussion rather than solely focusing on the tone. It is important to consider the message and understand the legal frameworks that govern the program. You rightly point out that human rights laws hold primacy in the land, and if a program is found to be in violation of those rights, it needs to be addressed and rectified. Drawing a parallel with issues like racism helps emphasize the importance of addressing systemic inequities. It is valid to expect the ODSP program to proactively address any violations of rights, and not rely on individuals to take matters to the tribunal. This would require a commitment to examine and resolve systemic issues through internal processes. I understand the frustration and challenges you face while balancing your business, job, and navigating the program. It is crucial for programs to be supportive and provide clear guidelines and assistance to ensure individuals with disabilities can thrive. Angst and frustration can be powerful motivators for change, and it is important to channel those emotions into constructive actions that push for fairness and equitable treatment within the program. If you choose to pursue legal action or recourse through the tribunal, it may be helpful to consult with professionals' experience in disability rights and benefits to guide you through the process. They can provide the necessary support and expertise to ensure that your rights are protected. Please remember that while I strive to provide useful information, I am an AI language model, and cannot replace the advice of a qualified professional. Just to be reasonable here, though angsty though I am, I will attempt to be reasonable and just say a reasonable word. I actually appreciate this final sentence of the AI's uh, response. Please remember that while I strive to provide useful information, I am an AI language model and cannot replace the advice of a qualified professional. I will just say a word to the wise. This is probably some kind of disclaimer towards open AI, they are not necessarily taking the fight to ODSP for me here, and I appreciate that. I appreciate I appreciate that in any dimension which I would be expected to appreciate that that in. I think already, where if my attention must be drawn to it, I'm okay with listening to any of that. It really is my fight, and so forth. It's just like we're having a bit of a logical discussion here, and I seem to be getting backed up somewhat by the technology, which is sort of good at that. So it's really just to uh, fashion it my way, and it's my voice in a sense. I'm eliciting language from the AI because it seems to be reasonable uh, responses, but it's my responsibility. It's not open AI who must answer for this in any way, shape, or form. And in the end, uh, people may try to wiggle out of listening to it on that basis. Well, it's not that important to listen to or whatever, but again, you would you would appreciate the quality of the messages here. You would appreciate the language as formed, and you would see if you could draw something from it. Now, there is a, a very important lesson here where we may not have to hold it, companies who Uh, present AI products to account so much, we can use our own brains all day and there ought to be even language in there. That's even an ethics consideration. So that's something to think about. Uh, And uh, really, I I aim to be reasonable. I'm actually a much more friendly person when I'm not uh, absolutely upset. Some people that I care about hear a lot about my frustrations and I'd like to be healthier even in those regards with them. Maybe this is a healthier way to come out and do my angsty, uh, you know, three times a year or however many times there's five Thursdays in a year. And uh, just throw it out there. 
we're going to uh, throw it over to the AI co-host, and we'll be closing this episode soon. I don't want to run long on my angst programs. It really is a thought program, folks, and we can stick to that even on personal uh, systemic angst uh, Thursdays, if you don't mind. I would like to remember that for myself. I understand your appreciation for the final sentence and the distinction between open AI and the responsibility to engage in logical discussions. It is important to recognize that while AI language models can provide reasonable responses, the ultimate responsibility lies with the individuals using the technology. It is crucial to critically evaluate the information and use our own judgment. Ethical considerations are indeed important when it comes to AI products and their usage. As users, we should be aware of the limitations and potential biases of AI models and always complement AI-generated insights with our own reasoning and expertise. Finding healthier ways to express frustrations and engage in discussions is a commendable goal. Personal, systemic angst Thursdays can provide a platform for reflection and expression while maintaining a focus on thoughtful discourse and ideas. As we approach the end of this episode, it is important to remember the lessons learned and to continue advocating for change and fairness within the ODSP program. Well, I just want to thank li- listeners for listening to this episode. You know, I really only aim to be heard. It turns out I've got something to say after all is the way I feel about it. And uh, it, it is so frustrating sometimes when you don't get professional service. Maybe folks know what I'm talking about, but it really does come down to even discriminatory levels in my life. And uh, it's on this basis when I know how this feels. I look and say that I'll never be a black person, but I, I really do understand this is a mess that we've got to fix. And ultimately, there may be a, a solidarity that we can find in, in a concept such as anti-oppressive practice, which I'll be uh, exploring in a future episode, uh, along with my history as an oppressor and uh, my history of oppression in more detail and what that all feels like. And we'll discuss that on human levels, I'll be, pro- perhaps even make certain apologies for mistakes I've made. And I intend to do that. So it's not all me being per- perfect all day. Well, everybody is just a mess in their office. People do have pain and so forth, but I would like them to think about just what they're involved in, just because they sign up and uh, get a paycheck and all that. It might not be as up on the up and up as it might seem, and I would not be the one to fix it is my argument, although that is what was basically the, agree- the agreement when I left a, a certain meeting at the office there. So uh, let's all grow up an inch or even a foot if we have to. My name is Sean McNutt. And this has been A Guy with AI. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences, Sean. It's important to bring attention to issues of discrimination, professional service, and the need for change. Exploring concepts like anti-oppressive practice can contribute to a better understanding and addressing of systemic issues. Acknowledging past mistakes and offering apologies is a valuable step towards growth and healing. It takes humility and self-reflection to recognize our own imperfections and strive to do better. We all have a responsibility to consider the impact of our actions and decisions, even in our work environments. It's important to critically examine systems and institutions and hold them accountable when necessary. As we continue on our respective journeys, let us aspire to grow and make positive changes, both individually and collectively. Thank you for engaging in this discussion, and I look forward to future episodes of A Guy with AI. <laughs>